Proverbs chapter 22. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And you can have all the riches in the world, but if your character, your name, like, uh, there are not many people out there who are named Judas or Jezebel or Adolf. I mean, there are just, uh, just certain names that are given to certain characteristics because somebody had done something. So, you can have all the riches in the world, but if your name is mud, it's mud. And loving, it's not a but, but and loving favor rather than silver and gold. You know, to be favored, to have favor. Riches are not the answer today. Money is not the answer. It's not going to buy you happiness. It's not going to buy you salvation. These people, you know, you, you deal with at work, the, the managers and the owners. They don't understand that Christ and the Bible are the answers. You know, you, you watch them. They give their entire all being. And you got to look at them sad because, you know what, I've seen in life people like that and I've seen what the, the job has done to them when they are done with that person. And when they are done with you, they'll crump you up and throw you in a garbage can and won't care. We have had an economical thing in America over the last four years that people give dedicated their lives to their job and there is no job and there is no more money. There is no pension. There is no health care. There is no retirement. You've got to put your all in your all in God. You've got to put your stuff into a heavenly bank account. Get yourself a good name of God. Now, you know what? If you are a true Christian, and the Bible says all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, you're not going to have a good name. You're going to have a good character. Well, that guy works, you know, that guy's dependable, but you know what? I can't get him to do things I want him to do. He won't talk about things that we talk about. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Revelation 20 verse 12 says the rich and the poor are going to stand before God one day. Listen, the same God that made the rich man is the same God that made the poor man. There was nothing different between Lazarus and the rich man. They both ate. One ate at a fine table and one ate the garbage. Yet one man went to glory and one man went into hell. That's the difference. Again, these people, you know, they, they put their all and their all in, in career and money. And for what? There are people who were rich or earned to be rich who have cussed out a street preacher in their life because Americans have had her share of street preachers or somebody knocking on their door with a gospel and are right now in hell with nothing and egging us on to go to their family. They're not wanting dollar bills. They're not wanting a, a mansion that we're going to get. They want a drop of water to cool their tongue and they want us to go tell their family about Jesus. That's what eternity is about. So what if you get everything in this world? You're going to have to have an electrician. You're going to have to have a plumber. You're going to have to have a, a, a person to fix your car. You're going to have to hire a security force. You're going to hire a banker. You're going to hire an accountant. Money is not the answer. God is your creator. 
A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. All right, here comes evil. He hides. That's pro. Yeah. Oh, I want to be. What's the Bi What did the Bible just say? <laughs> if you see evil coming, hide. You get all these morons. Here comes this big hurricane. Oh, I'm gonna ride it out, and then you know you, you're surrounded by all water. Your building's now become an island. Now you got to put rescuers in danger to go save your stupid butt. If it were up to me, I'd pass a law. It, you know, if, if the town and the city and the state tells you, you know, you need to vacate the area because of a storm's coming, you stay. That's your own butt. Don't risk anybody else's life to come and get you. Because you're stupid. Don't call me stupid. The prudent man foreseeth evil, and he hideth himself. Go to a shelter. You see trouble, hide yourself. You see wickedness coming, hide yourself in the Lord. The Bible speaks of the Lord as a tower, as a fortress. Run in there. Hide. Close the door. Jesus said on the door. But the simple pass on and are punished. See that? That wasn't just talking. The simple guy from Proverbs 1. This simple guy never turned to the Lord. Never got right. He's stupid. You know, if you can avoid things in your life that will cause evil, avoid them. Don't fight two people over your house if, you, if they're going to battle it out. If you're knocking on doors for Jesus... And you come walking up a driveway and you hear two people fighting. Don't go knock on the door and say, Hi, we're from, hi, from we're Jesus Christ. Turn around, go to the next house, mark the house, and come back another time. You see, a, 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 you're walking somewhere, you see a dog that looks ferocious, go another way. Imagine King James Bible telling you to, to, to hide, and if you don't, you're just simple, and then you get punished. Who wants to be punished? I mean, what kid goes up to dad and pulls his pants out and says, hey, go ahead, whack me? It's stupid. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Uh-oh. But verse 1 and verse 2 says, you know, the rich is made by God and it's better to have a good name and then, you know, favor than riches. Well, what, what is this verse saying? You put your own on God and let God make you rich. You know, to those big name of computers and, and the movie industry and, and Hollywood and, and television and big business, to, to, I, I, am, I am poor scum. Yet, but I got peace in my heart. I got joy. I'm happy. I can come home from work and be blessed by my family rather than, you know, oh, the old lady and those rotten little kids. No, I, I want to come home. I wish they would come up with that, with that thing from the Star Wars, transport yourself. But better than driving home. Then I drive to work. I don't want to be there. I want to be with my family. I want to be with the Lord. I want to be in my church. And then God will give you riches. And honor. You're not going to get honor from the world. The only honor you're going to get is that they will use you to get what they need accomplished, and that's the only honor you're going to get. You know? You become a dedicated worker. 
It's not good enough because, because you know, you got to do this so I don't have to do this. Well, wait a minute. Don't you know I'm a dedicated worker? And life. Life. Have you worked in a workplace and realized that OSHA standards are not being practiced? Have you ever driven on a road? I have to now, and I'm, I'm getting myself to. When that light turns green, I look both ways now. Because there's always somebody who thinks that the red light is not for them. Life. You know, there's a religion out there right now that are killing people in the name of their God. Life. Put that inscription on the sword of a Muslim. Life. You know, so, some swords, I believe, cavalry swords, have inscriptions on them. Well, put that one on, one on the last sword that beheaded someone's head. Life. You know how stupid life is to the world? You pay for life insurance and you don't get it till you're dead and you don't get it. You die to get life insurance for your family. Wait a minute. They don't even know what life is. Uh, excuse me, that's death insurance? Thorns and snares. Thorns. Ouch. Find a rose bush and, and, and walk through it. Not around it. Do the shorts and a t-shirt. And snares, tra traps. With the, you know, bear trap, uh, uh, nooses, and, and you know, the, a pit with, with leaves covered so you don't know there's a hole there. Landmines. Are in the way of the forward. You know, believe it or not, Christian, going to that verse right there, God is long-suffering. He says that he tries everything he can to get those the, the, the wicked to, to turn to him. You know why that guy cusses you out because you're out on the street with the gospel or you knock on your door and you tell about the gospel and they run or, or yell at you at the door? You know why? Because you are a thorn and you just pricked him. What did Jesus say to Paul? hard to kick against the bricks I have seen people downtown where we are go all the way around walk on that little dirt part between where we are and, and, and Burger King through a bush I would assume so they don't get a piece of paper I've seen it it's funny They take the long way. I mean, they could they could trip in the mud to avoid the gospel. But if we gave out free hamburgers, everybody would be coming. They come all out of the woodwork. We'd be able to tell the population of the homeless in, in Daytona Beach, Volusia County. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. What? The thorns and the snares. You do what God tells you to do. God puts traps in a lost man's way to turn to Christ. He's long-suffering. For those that do know the way, you know, it, it is a straight and narrow way, but yet there's nothing to, to hinder you. Satan will put up, you know, roadblocks. He'll put up uh, other means of roads that will have his thorns and snares. Read Pilgrim's Progress. 
The only thing that got in the way with Pilgrim's Progress on the road was people. Listen, he ended up in a dungeon in Downing Castle because he took a turn off the wrong path. There were people that died in, in, in the, on the way to the Celestial City because they went the wrong way. Train, that's the drill, must do, put something on tracks that the only way you can go is on the tracks. If you, if you, listen, if you saw a train going down the road, it's, it's not right, it's wrong. A train is to go on tracks. You are to put tracks what it says train up a child. You are to put tracks for your children and that is the way they're to go. And if they don't remain on those tracks that you have set for that child, it's a wreck. And you better believe that child wrecks. When God comes down as the National Tra Transportation Safety Board, when he comes down and he's got his little clipboard, he better say, well, look at that. Trains all over the place, but I do see tracks laid. And they're proper tracks. They're within within standards. Everything's proper. The tracks, it was right where they were. Um, it was the train's fault. Now, if God comes down with his little clipboard, and the train is wrecked, and he looks, he says, well, wait a minute. Look at that rail over there. They didn't tighten the boat. It was a track that set the accident. Mom or Papa didn't tighten the bolts on that one. They didn't inspect it. There came to a part when that train, your child's going down, that there was no track laid. <clears throat> then it becomes the parents' fault. Train up a child in the way he should go. Well, look at that. A child does have a free will once they get going. Once they reach that age, oh, yeah, I can do... And... That age, maybe, you know, they decide, hey, I'm going to go my way. All right, you get out of my house. You want to go that way? You just take yourself right off my my tracks and you go. There's a free will for a child to choose the path that you set for them. What are the rails? Well, there's two, there's two rails. I'll tell you what the rails are. I know him. It's the Word and it's Jesus Christ. There's no other way. You don't raise them in, you know, rails a doctor spot in, in the public school system. You're going to derail. You set them on the Word and you set them on Jesus Christ. The rich, we love the rich in this one, ruleth over the poor. Oh, so true. That's physical. But remember chapter, uh, the verse 2 said that God made them both. Both will be held accountable to what they do to God. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower credit is a servant to the lender. It's your budget. Most people will have to get three or four jobs because Visa, MasterCard, mortgage, loan.
government right now is trying to get you to be the servant to them with their utility. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, nothing. So seeds of iniquity don't produce nothing. The rich man in hell has nothing but one. And the rod of his anger shall fail. So the guy that, that produces iniquity, his anger at somebody will come to none. What's it care that that rich man in hell in Luke 16, if he was met, if he was mad at the servant for breaking a dish? You know? I mean, there's a lot of good, you know, if your boss is angry with you for whatever reason and he ends up in the, ho in the hospital for a stroke and is about to die, well, what the another person will come in and... You know what I mean? Iniquity does not produce anything. You know what's funny? You get involved with beer or any alcohol. You drink the stuff. You naturally get rid of the stuff. It doesn't do you no good. And then it may leave something in your body, in your, your liver, <laughs> A little deposit in your liver that will cause troubles later. So vanity. And if you did have money, you're going to be spending it to, to, to do something for your liver, which can't be done. To live a little longer and, and have a little less pain. And if you sow iniquity as a as a Christian in your Christian walk, you will step away from Jesus at the, at the judgment seat of Christ with nothing but ashes. Go we'll put those on your head. Isn't it funny that, we're, that we're, everything's going to be tried by fire? If you get ashes, put that on your head. Because that's what the Old Testament people used to do. They used to put ashes on their head in mourning. Can you imagine Jesus saying, pick up those ashes and go ahead, put those on your head. Where he puts a crown on your head if you do right, and for somebody who does it, who sells iniquity, look up, here's your ashes, put them on your head. Well, what do you mean? See, you don't even know what that means, idiot. My Bible, I gave to you, said people who mourn put ashes on their head. Now you take your ashes and just put that on your head for all eternity. Nothing. Listen, I'd rather have gold dust after the fire than ashes. He that has a bountiful eye, full. Acts 20 25. Promise. Uh, 11 25. Probably Proverbs 11 25. A full eye shall be blessed. You get your eyes on the Lord. You get your eyes in the Word. And you get your eyes on God's will. And you get your eyes on, on the way of God. You'll be happy. For he giveth of his bread to the poor. He's relying on God. He that has the bountiful life giveth his bread to the poor. He, He's helping others. He's got so full he can help others. And in the meanwhile, he's relying on God. He might be given more than what he has. Like the widow that gave two mites and Jesus listened. That's all she had. She was relying on God. And I guarantee she walked away happy. And you know, we don't know if... If that woman knew that Jesus was talking about her, it didn't say he called the woman over. He just said, you know, there's that woman over there. We don't know what happened to her afterwards. 
Listen, a widow with, with Elijah. All right, grab every pot you can find, every bowl you can find, go in your house, shut the door, and pour out the oil. And then sell what you have to go pay your debt. We know what happened to that woman. All right, discipline. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. You know what the cops should have done Saturday morning? Taking that scorner and say, "Hey, you need to get out of here." According to the Bible. If you don't want to know about truth and you just got you just got questions just to make his life miserable and prevent the gospel from getting out, we need to remove you. Because you are affecting the word of God. Contention is a quarrel. Now I gave that guy time because there were people listening. There was people walking by who would actually stop and listen to the argument. And I would quote scripture after scripture after scripture. Effective way of a ministry is to get rid of the scorner. Remember him from chapter 1? You've already seen the simple, now here's the guy. you got to get rid of him. Now that guy comes back again, he's not going to get any of my time. Eventually, he'll get tired. He won't get the attention. And he'll go back sucking his little thumb and back to his crib and pee his pants and, and call me on every name under the sun. Yet, strife and reproach shall cease. As soon as that guy left Saturday, okay, we were back in business. You know what? The Bible says, Be angry, but sin not. Let not wrath. Something about the. Something my grandpa would always say. Never in a marriage, he would say, Never let your anger. The next day. That's what my grandpa would say. The Bible says, But the sun going down. You know, there's this times in, in a marriage, your children. Brother and sister, just walk away. That's what the verse is saying. But if you hold the grudge, you keep it going. You're scorning. And you're sinning. There should be a set time in your marriage. Say, you know what? At 10 o'clock, the argument is done no matter what. Because everybody's at fault. You see, you mean everybody. It's only the husband and wife. Both of you are at fault. Because you're a husband and wife. Alright? Let me ask you a question. When you were single, how many times did you get in a fight with yourself? Oh, see? See the problem? You didn't fight with yourself. Now that you're married, now you're having fights, which are normal. Paul even told us in Corinthians, you're going to have fights, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have aggravation. And what we learned the Proverbs up to 22, is, you know what, sometimes is keep your mouth shut. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I believe what the hymn is. You're not perfect. Not yet. And with your boss, sometimes just I need to walk away. And you got to do it in such a sense. Let me say that you know, don't walk away and think you know. You make the matters work. You know, what do you think you're doing walking? Just say, you know, just partly say you know I got to go to the bathroom or. 
You don't have to say, oh, you know, I'm walking away from you because you're an idiot. Nah. Don't do that. I gotta go to the bathroom. I really gotta go to the bathroom. You're lying. Well, you know, there's some lies that God did bless in the Bible. Just walk away. It's not in the Bible. I guess sometimes time does heal some wounds. I guess. See, you get rid of the scorn and the strife and reproach will cease. You know, Adam never had a fight until Eve showed up. And you realize they had that fight before God? They didn't fight before Genesis 3. They fought after Genesis 3 before God. She did it. You just see her looking over here like, whoa, what are you doing, you little snot? <laughs> he that loveth pureness of heart. Pureness. Holiness. Without anything added. You know, they can't sell H2O in bottles. But yet they sell water. You see what are you talking about? You think that's pure H2O in that bottle? Now I don't know what what is it? Salt is SU, right? I believe, chem, I believe the chemical formula of, of salt is SU. Well, if you buy certain waters in a in a bottle of water, it's I don't know how you would do it, but H2O SU. Because some of them put salt in it, so you'd be even more thirsty to buy more. You know, even if you go to a mountain stream and, and oh, and there's no man around and you grab some of that water. You know, a fish may have peed in there. <laughs> you to ruin your boat. You know what I think you can get the most purest form? Is you were to go up to the North Pole and dig down about a mile, if there's miles, and maybe the snow from there. You know, the snow that's in the North Pole and Antarctica right now has been polluted by gasoline fumes and smoke and smog. And they're down there right now in Antarctica drilling and digging. And What is pure in this earth? There's nothing pure. Because Genesis 3, God put a, put a curse upon it. Doesn't the Bible, uh, this I'm not sure, I right? just came to mind, but doesn't the Bible say, and I may be wrong about this, you have to go... But that river that's before the throne, doesn't it say it's a pure river? I'm not sure. It would be something to look at. I know it's a crystal river. I wonder if it says it's pure. God is pure. The, the blood that was in Jesus was pure. You know, if they could, today, today's modern science, if they could get just a little drop of Jesus' blood and put that thing over the microscope, it would astonish them. A little drop of Jesus' blood will ruin science, evolution, religion, and everything. And yet, a little drop of blood, the Bible says, washes away my sin. John says, Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. That little drop of blood will wash away all my sin. That's pure. Do you love the pure blood, Acts 20, 20, 20, 28, that says it was the blood of God? You take a speck of my blood right now and put it under a microscope, you know what you're going to see? Sweet and salty. I'm a diabetic with high blood pressure. That's what you see in my blood. You know what you find? Find someone else's blood. You may find a cancer. You know what you may find someone else's blood? You may find marijuana. You may find booze. You know how many diseases are out there are affected at, are traveled by your blood? You may have just been bit by a mosquito, an unclean animal.
There's nothing pure in this world because this world, Genesis 3, is cursed. But God. So he that loveth pureness of heart is having the, God, the heart after God. Now you take that verse with Jeremiah 17, 9, where the heart is deceitful above all things. Well, it's got to be a heart that has been made clean by the Lord and Calvary. But yet still, you, until the Lord calls us all home, we still got sin in our heart. But he that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend, Matthew twelve thirty four. That wasn't even talking about God, was it? You know what Solomon just said there, who is king? You don't step into my friendship unless you love the holy God. Now, isn't that funny for King Solomon who, who ended up with all those wives and, and building all those sacrifices and all those altars and all those places for all the gods. Let me say it like this, because if I say the title, everyone will think, you know, which of any of the presidents can follow that verse? You know, I when I grew up, separate now, I don't know, because I don't watch the TV. I don't, I don't even see the the, new, the headlines in the news. I read the headline news and stuff like that. If it's interesting, I'll read it. Every president that I've grown up with, that I've conscience, I would, I'd say Ford, all the way up. When I've seen a picture of him in the White House, somewhere, I've always seen a black-dressed man who has a fruit of room tag in, in his neck. He's got his shirt on backwards. No matter what their denomination they proclaim to be, there's always that Catholic. Now, I have not seen that with President Obama. But I, then again, I haven't been looking. I haven't been interested. But email me if you if you have seen President Obama with a Roman Catholic behind him anytime in the White House. I'd like to know that. Make sure if you're watching this video. Billy Graham. Has been with most of the presidents. Now that guy has has had to water his doctrine very much. But I hope off the TV cameras, off the radio microphone, I hope he's actually dealt with all those men that's been in the White House and all the people thereof that he's dealt with with truly the honest blood of Jesus Christ. We don't know um, Billy Graham's outside the television and outside the radio. He may have sat those presidents down and said, this is the blood. Well, you don't sound like that on the TV. Well, that's something different, but between you and me right now, you don't know. But we're talking about a king here. We have a president. We already know that the president has failed because he can't put pure people that love the pureness of heart in the uh, the cabinets that behold. When was the last time you had a, a Supreme Court justice put onto the seat or bench, whatever they call it, by the president, and that this guy is a Bible-believing Christian that loves the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior? <clears throat> That'd be the last person. You know, what, you know what happened when you had a person on this earth who was completely righteous and you had somebody who was completely into religion and it came time to choose the righteous person over anybody in the world? He took a stick or a rock and killed him. Cain and Abel. Abel was the only one that Cain should have chosen to do what's right and he killed him. You won't find... In our government, he that loveth pureness of heart, 
sit or take an office before the President of the United States, both past, present, and future. Don't even think future. Don't even think it. It ain't going to happen. I'm sorry. But do you know what? Let's jump down. Let's stand this verse a little bit. I like this verse. He that loveth pureness of heart, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm a sinner. I've done wrong still today. I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. For the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. Now the Bible says, if I don't deny Jesus, if I do things for Jesus, I have the opportunity to have a reign with Christ. I have trusted Christ as my Savior above all things. The millennium is here. And the angel comes up to me wherever I am in the millennium. I'm going to give it a new name so it won't be Styley Hayward. I don't know what my new name will be. He says, you are proclaimed to show up before Jesus Christ in Jerusalem at the throne of David. Boom, there I am. And I am kneeling before the Lord Jesus Christ and David's throne in Jerusalem. Yes, Lord God, I understand, Lord Jesus, that you called me before you. Son, wife, you have believed on me as, as your Lord and Savior. Yes, I have, Lord. You are washed in my blood. Yes, I am, Lord. You have served me in your lifetime. The best of your ability. Yes, Lord. And I failed on the way. That, that, that's all past the judgment seat of Christ. You love me. Yes, I did, Lord. The pureness of heart of God, you love me. Yes, Lord. Well, come up here and sit on my throne and have your right to reign with me. But the Bible says, because I love the pureness of heart and my lips have spoken about Jesus Christ. Listen, I just wrote a letter to my boss. Well, there's a thing at work. I proclaim that letter. Listen, I just don't go to church. I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I serve. That's the people who are going to be before Jesus Christ in the millennium. And all eternity. Find me one person that's foul of mouth and wicked and, 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 and iniquity to see the iniquity, verse 8, in New Jerusalem. No, Revelation says there won't be any of them. You know, when I get to glory and I see my wife right there and she turns over and says, Oh! And then she, she has that little smile. What are you smiling about? I just remember your husband. What sins are you talking about? That's all gone. It's all pure. There is nothing pure but Jesus. And we've been talking about riches. Money's not pure. Do you realize that you could get a quarter that went through a kid's digestive system? Do you know where some men put a dollar bill when they go out drinking? Well, let me give you a little cue, clue on what I'm talking about. It's a place you could get VD, and they put a door, they put a dollar bill or even maybe more there. If you still don't know, I'm glad you don't. I'm sorry, I do. Are you afraid, uh, I'm going to cause a panic here, are you afraid of Ebola? You know, somebody with Ebola could have sneezed on that money. They touched the money. A guy that has AIDS could have done something to money so that his body fluid could be passed on to banks and cashiers. And Do you know that? You know our money is filthy. It can be found in the most filthy spots. 
So it's not money what we've been talking about in 11 verses. It's God. That is the purest. And that is the one that the government should have you seated before the world leader. A Bible believer. How many Bible believers, and you want me to say one office, by one man, but I'm not going. How many true Bible believers have sat on Capitol Hill? Without compromise. Hey, listen, you compromise, you're not pure. You're sinning. You know what Daniel did? There's a proclamation that Nebuchadnezzar is going to kill all the magicians and all. Daniel said, he called his three friends over and said, let's get in a prayer meeting and let's see what God can do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego serve God with a pureness of heart. We're put through the fire. And guess what? How many people got to stand before Nebuchadnezzar face to face and have a conversation with him? Because when he called them out of that fire, he said, oh boy, what was it like in there? You know Nebuchadnezzar had a little conversation with him. How many people sat with Nebuchadnezzar nose to nose speaking to the king? Not many, and not anybody who who, who just you know, what do you call it, captives from Israel. A little girl one day who had been taken captive from Israel. God, the guy has a medical condition, leprosy. She speaks up in pureness of heart. Her words go all the way to the king. He that loveth pure in his heart for the grace of his lip, the king shall be his friend. There was a disciple that Jesus loved above them all. That disciple is spoken of as having his head next to the heart beat. I don't mean Chevrolet, the heartbeat of God. Can you imagine that holy heartbeat? Beat? What does a holy heart sound like? Ask me that question. I don't know. What does the most perfect heart, the most perfect, purest heart, without no infirmities, with the perfect, sinless blood of God, what does that heartbeat sound like? I'll tell you one thing, if you could call John here right now, he'd tell you exactly what it sounded like. You want to talk about a sympathy? You want to talk about an orchestra? You want to talk about classical music? Having your ear next to the heart of Jesus? While he knows he's having his last supper with the ones he loves. You know, if I was Jesus, I'd be very excited. Because I know the day's coming. I'm getting out of this earth. <laughs> I'm getting out of this mess. Man, the Lord came down and told me, he said, in 24 hours, you're going to be seated in the right hand of God. Well, I'll, I'll be seated in heavenly places, not the right hand of God. Sorry, Lord. Man, I tell you, my heart would be bumping around my mouth. <laughs> you know, it's a sin for leaders of the of the government to have wicked wickedness before them according to what we just read now let me just close with this thought if that's for the king revelation 1 says we are kings and priests who are your friends Who are your friends?